So I hope this screencast will be short and sweet, um, but as you all know, I like to talk, so it might get a little bit long, so bear with me as we get through some of this content. Um, within your readings, there is very little on gastrointestinal, reno, um, genitu, urinary, endocrine, immunological, and integumentary systems within your textbook. So I did, we did give you some resources, but we also wanted to give you some um, information that you should keep in the front of your brain when you're working with clients with diagnosis related to these um, system disorders. So as you, um, we've told you in the past, really the, the way the exam questions are set up are not to directly um, ask you questions about the structures of the systems, but rather big picture, how do those system functions um, help you understand the underlying conditions of the clients that you're working with? And that information will then help you understand and answer some of the more in-depth questions. So starting with your gastrointestinal system, this is your GI tract. Now, big picture, this is primarily um, related to dysphagia and swallowing disorders, but this is going to be covered in um, your lecture with um, uh, Sonia Boltanski um, in a couple of weeks, so I don't want to go too in-depth into this section, but really I want to focus on the areas of constipation, small bowel obstruction, and neurogenic bowel. So constipation is a huge concern for many of our clients across the spectrum of diagnoses and across the lifespan from infants and children to adults to older adults. As our system changes, our um, bowel system changes. Um, disease processes can change how we are able to effectively eliminate. Um, Age can impact it, um, different conditions can impact it, and constipation is a huge area of concern because it can cause a whole host of problems. So when you're working with a client, asking them about their latest bowel movement is one of the most important questions that you can ask them. Um, I think we've spent a fair amount of time talking about poop because it's so important to how we function and how comfortable we are. So for the child who's having GI issues or the infant that's having GI issues and is not eliminated, eliminating regularly, how that impacts their behavior. From the client who's had some sort of hip replacement or they're on pain medication and how that slows the motility of the GI system. Um, for your older adults who maybe are less active, and again, that's slowing the motility of the bowels. So as the OT, why is that important to know? Well, if your client feels terrible and they're reporting new vomiting, new onset nausea, um, if they haven't had a bowel movement in over two to three days, they likely... Um, they will need some sort of um, stimulant to help them go because anything more than two days can possibly lead to a small bowel obstruction. So a small um, bowel obstruction can be secondary to scar tissue. It can be related to any sort of procedure on the abdom uh, abdomen, um, but it can also be related to severe constipation where then there is an obstruction within the bow small bowel system. There is, so this is the like worst case, um, along with small bowel obstruction is an ileus where the actual um, small bowel stops moving. So poop is just so important. So you wanna let the doctor know if there hasn't been a productive bowel movement within two days. And productive, it is not diarrhea. Diarrhea is also can be a sign of constipation because there's something that's not because, but there is still some sort of obstruction, hard fecal matter, and the poop is just oozing around um, the that fecal matter. So just because some of them have diarrhea does not mean that they are not constipated. 
So um, this is, is so important and it could lead to potential surgeries. It could lead to potential um, where you need to have, have bowel movements through a stoma and that has been created in the stomach and what that looks like. Um, so it's, it's just a really huge issue. So um, making sure people are pooping is the moral of the story. The other um, issue is neurogenic bladder, and this is directly related to some sort of nerve impairment. And you will often see this with your lower motor neuron um, injuries, such as spinal cord injury, um, especially above the level of T6. There's loss of control of the anal sphincter. Um, there's sensory loss resulting in lack of awareness of the feces in the bladder. There could be a motor loss resulting in decreased or lost ability to um, self-initiate or control um, bowel movements. So because of flaccidity of the muscle, it could result in incontinence, and um, it could also lead to autonomic, autonomic, I apologize, dysreflexia, which is that sudden spontaneous increase in um, pressure, uh, blood pressure, which can be um, in our spinal cord injury clients, that can be deadly for them, and that can be directly related to having some form of constipation or bowel impaction or them needing to use the bathroom, which causes that autonomic dysreflexia. So pooping, super important. Eating important, pooping important. So just as important as pooping is peeing. We have the renal genito genitourinary system. I'm sorry, it's such a mouthful. So this is your kidney, urinary tract, and genital tract system, specifically, generally for um, the male anatomy, that urinary tract. So within this system and within disorders in this system um, fall diabetes. And later on, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about diabetes, but you know, three in every 10 individuals with diabetes develop kidney failure, which is a huge number. So looking at you know, big picture diabetes, how we can facilitate um, nutrition, exercise, and the side effects related to diabetes, um, as we learned from the prosthetics lab, um, the num one of the number one ways of limb loss is directly related to diabetes and peripheral, vac peripheral vascular disease. And within, you know, the diabetes um, diagnosis, of the 60 to 65 percent of people with diabetes also have high blood pressure, and that uncontrolled hypertension can lead to. Um, damage to the kidney, which can re to lead to chronic kidney failure, um, big picture. So it's, it's, a, it's very serious um, keeping diabetes under control. And it's important for you to understand what the, oh, I'm sorry, understand what the stages of diabetes are. So there are five stages of kidney disease. I'm sorry, the stages of kidney disease. So the first stage is really your prevention um, of the progression of the disease process. Two is management of the general health con conditions. Three, management of anemia and bone loss related to kidney disease. Four is education on further management that they may have to go through, um, such as dialysis. And then stage five is um, for life to be sustained, the person must receive either dialysis or have a kidney transplant. So understanding what those different um, stages are and what they mean. And um, the signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease are critical to recognize. So these might be vomiting, loss of appetite, fatigue and weakness, sleep disorders, changes in the urinary output. Um, they might not be peeing as much decreased mental clarity, any sort of muscle twitches and cramps, excessive swelling in the feet and ankles, persistent itching, um, any sort of chest pain because of fluid building up in the lining of the heart, 
which directly relates to shortness of breath, which is fluid buildup in the lungs, and then uncontrolled um, high blood pressure can all be signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease. So this is important for us to know when we're working with our clients so that we're able to alert the medical team um, of changes with our clients. So there are several forms of medical treatment, um, dialysis being one of them, and other sort of um, nephrotic uh, syndrome treatments, such as providing um, drugs to control fluid overload or spillage of protein into the urine. So these might be your Lasix. So as the OT, why are these things important to understand? One, to help with a plan for your client to get to and from the bathroom if, they're, if they have urgency because of the Lasix, which is eliminating fluid from the body helping them get to the bathroom effectively. Um, how do they wash their clothes? If there is urinary incontinence, how do they use urinary incontinence pads or other um, devices? How do we facilitate them getting enough fluids? Because so many much fluid is cut up being uh, removed from the body. How do we um, kind of help them find that balance? We also are looking at facilitating healthy habits. So um, making recommendations for smoking cessation and giving them that education, um, talking about alcohol use and how it can dehydrate um, the body, how looking at and educating on how different medications can um, um, maybe overtax the organs um, and then causing that challenge with filtering out byproducts, looking at different diets, talking about physical activity, um, talking about how important sleep is, talking about, or I shouldn't say talking, educating on over-consuming salt and sugars. So these are areas as the OT when we're doing education with our clients that are so critical. Um, now, how it does all of this impact occupational performance? It, across all systems, we can see some sort of impact. If it's motor skills, secondary to fatigue, muscle pain, um, edema, weakness, we might see sensory skills that are impacted because of neuropathy directly related to diabetes or vision loss directly related to diabetes. Um, any sort of toxicity in the system because this, the renal system is how toxins are being removed and filtered out from the body. We might see some cognitive changes, so being aware of that. Um, any sort of perceptual motor changes related to those sensory or um, uh, related to those visual changes. So impact you know, across all systems, we're seeing those occupational performance impacts, and then those impact all areas of occupation. So in terms of what can we do as the OT, we're doing education, education, education. We're incorporating um, adaptive strategies and adaptive equipment. We're educating on energy conservation. We're talking about lifestyle choices and changes and redesigns, health promotion and prevention. Um, education, education, we're referring out into the community for s supports and programs to su help our clients. And we're doing COG and um, visual, uh, cognitive and physical assessments all the time to facilitate their ability to perform ADLs and IADLs. And part of our, our um, our job is really looking at how to facilitate them being able to get to dialysis um, because they might not be able to drive. So how are they getting to dialysis? How are they managing their shunt? Are they able to do perineal um, dialysis, which does not include a shunt, but has a whole process that needs to be um, monitored? So, you know, what that looks like as the OT. All right, so immunological system disorders, big picture, these are particularly cancer, primary, both as a primary and secondary condition. So we need to understand the etiology of the cancer, um, what the risk factors are, because 
again, we're coming back to education. But cancer oftentimes is, can, we will be seeing clients from a primary, um, as a primary condition, but also as a secondary condition. So we might be working with somebody who had a tumor resection in their brain, but they're seeing you for rehab because of weakness related to that surgery. So the the weakness is the reason that you're seeing them. The cancer is the secondary condition. Or you're seeing somebody um, status post lower extremity amputation from a sarcoma where there was the cancer within the bone and the only way to remove the cancer is to remove the limb. So now you're doing prosthetic training with somebody who has had um, limb loss because of cancer. So again, the cancer is not the primary condition, but the amputation is, but we have to understand um, how all of those pieces fit together and what the treatments might be to address the cancer while they're also receiving the services from you. We might have somebody who has cancer in their history, such as breast cancer, and they've had a mastectomy, but that mastectomy was 15 years ago. But we still need to be aware of lymph edema and lymph um, and, and supporting the limb that does or the, the system that doesn't have a breast because they're more prone to lymphedema. So understanding that we don't do blood pressures on the limb that has had the breast removed because of the the fragility of the lymph system and then potentially causing and exacerbating any sort of lymphedema. We also need to understand when somebody is in an acute phase of cancer that we do not provide the diagnosis or prognosis of cancer. So you're working with somebody with a tumor resection. It's critical for you to understand if it is a um, benign tumor, if it is a tumor that is cancerous, if it is metastasized or spread, we have to understand that because we need to understand, A, I'm not telling somebody the prognosis of their cancer if they have not spoken to a doctor. I need to understand if I'm working with somebody in hospice or palliative care, I need to understand that I'm not going to talk to the client about recovery because they are maybe actively dying or their lifespan has is shortened because of the cancer. So I need to understand what the different categorizations of the cancers are and be spe the specific type of cancer so that then I can understand what my treatment plan is going to look like. I also need to understand the stages of cancer. Stage one, the tumor is present. There's no perceived spread. The lesion is operable. Prognosis is fairly good. Stage two, it started to spread. It's still operable, um, but there might be a limit of reduced survival rate. Stage three, extensive evidence of primary tumor that's thread spread throughout the organs. So we're talking about metastatic um, type cancers, widespread cancer. Four, stage four, inoperable, um, and we're looking at more palliative um, care. We need to understand the different types of medical treatments, such as surgeries, chemotherapies, radiation, immunotherapies, hormone therapies, or any sort of transplants. And understanding that the risk for developing infections um, that can be life-threatening are vastly increased. And what is our role in, in from the rehab perspective? It, are we part of the perioperative team where before the surgery, they're getting education and rehab for us, or is it and or is it that post-operative care um, that they're receiving from us? Is it end stage or is it palliative? You know, understanding what our role is um, within the the OT process. And then sclerodermas, this is also an immunological system disorder. This is a rheumatic connective tissue disease. Um, associated with impaired immune response. The etiology, etiology oh my gosh, um, of this is unknown. You might have heard of vascular um, sclerodermas, such as your Raynaud's syndrome, 
um, pulmonary hypertension and decreased esophageal motility. It might be fibrotic, where there's scar tissue resulting from excess collagen, um, causing thickness of skin and burning sensation in the skin, or you might have um, fibrosis of the lungs, which might cause some sort of restrictive lung disease. Now, as we go through these system disorders, you'll start to notice some similarities or um, co-conditions in the cardiopulmonary system. So we're talking about fibrosis of the lungs directly related to a scleroderma, but this is also then becomes a cardiopulmonary disorder and what that looks like for us as the OT. So again, what is our role? Um, potentially splinting to reduce contractures. We're doing, um, for Raynaud's phenomenon, we're keeping the fingers and toes warm. We're educating on dressing in layers. We maybe are doing splinting to prevent contractures because of the tightening of this, the thickening of the skin um, in the fibrotic type. We're looking at, you know, if there's facial disfigurement because of that tightening of the scar tissue, how to help the client have a positive self-image. That might be where our role is. And of course, from the rehabilitative um, frame of reference, looking at functional deficits and how do we facilitate um, their our client's independence. Um, it, HIV AIDS is still you know, something that we will be um, seeing in our clinic. And you might be working with somebody who has um, HIV AIDS and we need to be aware of how to treat them with dignity, how to um, remembering standard precautions when working with any client. And this goes along with hepatitis as well, tuberculosis, um, MRSA, all of these immunological system disorders that are directly related to some sort of infection, how to protect them and how to protect ourselves. And from the rehab perspective or from the OT's role, again, we're looking at prevention, education, restoration, um, supporting, and any sort of palliative measures depending on the treatment setting, diagnosis, stage of the illness, and expected outcomes. Endocrine system disorders, going back to diabetes. Um, so we know that diabetes is has two types, type one and type two. Um, type one is generally um, autoimmune, genetic, maybe related to environmental factors. Juvenile diabetes, or at younger ages, um, we'll see, you might see this diabetes, or type 2, which is, I think, what most of us are familiar with, which is directly related to older age, uh, obesity, lifestyle, family history, um, physical inactivity, and race and ethnicity also can impact um, the risk of or the possibility of type 2 diabetes. So for us, we need to know signs and symptoms of hypo or hyperglycemia. Um, if you're working with a client and they suddenly go pale, they start to sweat, their heart rate goes up, they become tacky, um, diaphoresis, sweating, they um, are reporting dizziness, maybe their cognition becomes a little hazy or fuzzy, it could look a lot like hypotent a hypotensive episode or orthostasis, or it could be a hypoglycemic episode. So we need to understand what to look for and then how to manage that. So if it's quickly getting the client into a safe position, calling the nurse to get a finger stick, or if you're in the home doing a, finger, a sugar check to make sure that they're what sort of event they're going, if they're having a hypoglycemic event, because if it goes uncontrolled, they could fall into some sort of um, unconscious or coma state. We also need to understand um, ketoacidosis, and this is can be um, dehydration. They might have a, um, a smell to their breath, like an acetone smell to their breath, 
They might have um, rapid or weak pulse, again, that tachycardia. So we want to make sure that they receive medical treatment immediately if they're having some sort of crisis. So for us, prevention education, also, um, if you're working with somebody who has had a stroke and they need to do finger checks, how do we facilitate that? If you have a client who has diabetic retinopathy, what, how do we facilitate their low vision for their safety within the community and within um, um, ho the home in the community? So big picture, you know, what does this mean for our client? Obesity and bariatric issues, this is kind of a, a huge one for me. Um, because with people um, with obesity and bariatric issues, really it comes down to primarily respect and dignity. How do you treat a client with respect and dignity who is obese or um, is bariatric? And again, education, getting the education, 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 but really also getting the correct equipment for that client. So if you are in a rehab facility, skilled nursing, acute care, acute uh, rehab, long-term care, and you're working with somebody who falls into the weight category of obese or bariatric, they need to have the correct equipment to be able to be safe within that environment. So if it's a bed, a commode, walker, um, ceiling lift, so that it can support the weight of that client. And then facilitating education with the, the staff so that they're protecting themselves, you're protecting yourself, and the client is getting the care that they need. Um, Lyme's disease, this is more of um, understanding the underlying causes of um, Lyme's disease, but bigger picture, understanding that there is late arthritis can be a side effect of Lyme's disease. There could be nervous system abnormalities. So when we're working with these clients, understanding that underlying condition, we might be treating the joints for pain and swelling. Um, we might be following up with um, some form of uh, rehab for these clients so that they can manage their symptoms in a more comfortable sort of way. All right, wounds. This is a huge topic. This is an area, a specialty area. There are um, different types of wounds, but you need to understand how wounds are caused and then how to prevent further damage for the wounds. So making sure that your client is in the right sort of bed if they have limited mobility, understanding if you how to position heels and bony prominences to reduce pressure so that they don't end up with wounds, understanding the different types of stages. Um, stage one is like a bruise. If you see a blister, um, that could also fall into stage one. Do, don't ever, 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 ever puncture a blister because underneath that blister, it might look really, really deep so that the blister is actually a protective covering. So don't ever touch a blister. Um, understanding what stage two, stage three, and finally stage four, what that looks like. But for us, again, it goes right back to prevention. Prevention with the equipment that we use, the nutrition that we're educating the client on or um, advocating for our client's nutrition, um, understanding the causes of wounds, if it's from the perspective of from diabetes and um, peripheral vascular system changes, understanding what factors predispose us or a client to um, developing ulcers, primarily mobility um, issues, any sort of weight loss or gain so that is significant swelling incontinence so if a client is laying in a bed in urine or feces how that moisture can um, increase the risk of um, ulcers dehydration inadequate nutrition just age-related skin changes becoming the skin becoming more um, fragile so how do we as the ot promote the healthy system or the the client reducing the risk of some sort of skin issue 
So that is it. I hope that was helpful. Um, and I, please have, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions.